and welcome to The Herd Has Spoken, a podcast brought to you by Muskox Men's Apparel. Hey guys, Brad Hoos here, your host of The Herd Has Spoken. Really excited to have you join me for today's episode, episode number 27 with Chad Lubinsky. Chad is an accomplished ultra marathon runner, although he does consider himself to be a mediocre endurance athlete. We'll get into that um, in, in today's uh, in today's episode. But what, what I really love about Chad is his journey to becoming an uh, ultra marathon runner and what he's learned about himself, his life, and his approach to the outdoors from challenging himself repeatedly time and time again and spending so much time outdoors. So I'm really excited about Chad's uh, discussion today. I'm really proud to have Chad on the on the podcast as well. Chad's a huge supporter of Muskox. Um, right before we started the podcast, he went into talking about his love for the Charleston, how important it was for him as part of his journey on the Colorado Trail recently. So if you haven't yet done it, uh, t- checked out Muskox for yourself, do yourself a favor, go to Go Muskox dot com and check out everything you may need for your next adventure so with no further ado my conversation with chad lubinsky chad lubinsky welcome to the herd has spoken yes thank you so much for having me i really appreciate it it's an honor to be out here so, yeah well yeah. i guess in here <laughs> so, yeah. i like i like you thinking out there in terms of the outdoors that doesn't su- that doesn't surprise me and We'll, we'll get into we'll get into all your outdoor adventures, but I, I want to yeah. start by understanding how does a cheese in Oregon compare to cheese in Wisconsin? Oh gosh! So I will say this. Okay, so you know cheese curds in Wisconsin are like a super big thing, right? And because you you guys are based in Michigan, right? We are, yes. Yeah, so like you kind you kind of know this stuff, right? So cheese curds are way better in Wisconsin, but I will say there is a Tillamook cheese factory out on the coast in Oregon that I, I'm not going to lie. It kind of rivals some of the Wisconsin cheeses. I don't think they got the whole smorgasbord, you know, but it definitely (laughs) comes pretty close. It's like some high quality cheese. It's good stuff, but you know, Wisconsin always has my heart. So (laughs) (laughs) I love it. I love it. So you you grew up in Wisconsin, found found yourself out to the uh, Pacific Northwest and and now you're, you're doing all sorts of crazy um, adventures. So we'll, we'll certainly get into your, your story a little bit and and how you, 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 you got out to, uh, to the, to the Pacific Northwest, but we would love to hear just for, for those people who are listening, who may not be familiar with it. What is an ultra marathon? Yes. So an ultra marathon is technically considered anything after a marathon. So what is it? 26.2 miles, right? So basically it's, it can range from a 50 K, which is about 31.1 miles. That's usually like kind of the starting point for an ultra. And then it goes up to a 50 miler, um, a 100 K, which I think is like 60 high sixties. And then usually the most popular ones are like the hundred milers. So that's like what everybody kind of strip, at least that's what I'm striving to get to. I think, um, they even go past that. There's, there's like a Bigfoot 200 up at Rainier, which is nuts. Um, but yeah, for, but for me, I think, uh, you know, for, for the ultra scene, I want to get up to that a hundred mile race for sure. And I think, that's even kind of when I would consider myself really an ultra marathoner. I think that's like the kind of the, the gold standard for me, I think. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So maybe, maybe you've already sort of unpacked this. I know you are a self-described mediocre endurance yeah. athlete, but I did yet, say that to say, yeah, <laughs> but yet you, you have run ultra marathon. So what, yeah. what, what to you, uh, yeah. would, would you consider to be a strong endurance athlete because to me I'm like wow like i feel i feel like you're already there but obviously the bar is just really high yeah. in your world yeah you know i i think it happens too because i was actually just listening to this podcast where this guy has run like all these hundred mile ultra marathons you know and like does several like, like tons in a year like with like a 6 30 pace and i'm just like wow like so when i think about myself compared to that i'm like oh my gosh you know like this just seems so crazy, but yeah, for, so for me, um, 
you know, I think once I, like I said, once I get to that hundred mile, that's when you actually get like a little belt buckle with it and all this kind of cool rad stuff. Um, I think that's where I really consider myself um, as an endurance athlete. I guess whenever I, I conquer something, I kind of just keep putting the bar a little bit further, a little bit further. And because I, I just, I guess I keep, uh, I kind of create a kind of a longer takeoff pad, if you will, you know? And so I keep kind of just reaching and striving and, and knowing that I can do better. So, so yeah, I, uh, yeah, I guess that's, it's a long answer, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> So if I told you the Bigfoot 200 was, was in your future, would that surprise you at all? Knowing that you always want to go like one step further, you know, possibly, I, I don't know if I want to go past the 100 because a hundred to me is like, okay, that's like, okay, I'm pretty, you know, I'm pretty good with that. Like if I do a hundred, that, that sounds pretty cool. I think from there, I would probably transition to finding something a little bit, a little bit different, maybe like a bike across America sort of thing or, or something like that. Like, a little bit of an endurance because that's a lot of running it's a like lot training for this of stuff. running yeah it's it's like uh you know i uh when i was training for my 50 i had the, there was a couple training runs where i actually had to run like a trail marathon right you know and so i'd run these marathons or whatever and, and then i was kind of an idiot because i get home and i realized i only ran 26.1 so i had to do the net the other point <laughs> two when i got home so i'm in my yeah, I'm like in my crocs and I'm like laying down and you know, I'm just like kind of dead. I'm like, oh my God, I didn't run the other point one. So I like got out, got <laughs> my watch, ran out, did the point one in my crocs. You know, my neighbors were like, what is going on? Just going back and forth down the street and stuff. And, uh, but you know, it's a lot of running. It's a lot of, it's a lot of commitment. It's not, you know, there's been people that, you know, can do it without no training, but they're severely like injured afterwards, you know, for weeks and weeks on end. Um, but for me, I like to really prepare and it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time. You're just running, you know? (laughs) Yeah. That, that is one of the hardest parts about any sort of endurance or just long, again, I'm thinking of an Ironman or something of of the equivalent. It just takes a lot of time to, to train, which doesn't always gel well with having a, having a full-time job, frankly. Yes, exactly. And that's actually, I'm glad you brought up the Ironman because that is something I would be interested in after the hundred. So yeah, we'll see. I, I think I will say this. I don't think that I particularly like skillful in anything really. I think that I just can like deal with sucky stuff or sucky situations for a longer period of time, more than most people. Um, and, and that's kind of like a muscle, right? Like the more you do it, right. Definitely the easier it kind of becomes and the more you actually weirdly like crave of it. So it's just weird. I think I've always been like that when I was even like a, a little kid, I would like my, my dad would throw me the football or whatever. And I'd always be like, Hey, do it. Like do it more challenging. I want it more challenging. Right. Or something like that. Or I remember we have like uh we had like 40 acres back home in Wisconsin and you know, I was a little kid, so I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but like, I just wanted to like chop down this tree. <laughs> I was like, you know, I was like, I was like, I don't know. I was like 12 or like 14 or something. And I was like, and it took me, I just remember it like took me forever to do this, but I was like, just having so much fun. I don't know. One of, it's a weird, weird kind of thing, I think. <laughs> so. Yes. So I'm, I'm curious to what extent this desire to like train and do one step beyond what you've already done like, how does that, re- how is that reflected in your personality? So I would guess, right. And, and, and I'm, I'm curious if this is correct or way off base here that you might be more of a perfectionist, right. In that, like, yeah. Hey, I ran the 26 miles, but I didn't run the 26.2 or I ran 26.1 and I'm missing that 0.1. Like I got, I got to go finish that. So how, how does like your training fit with your personality? Yeah, I'm very type A. Like I'm very, I'm very, I'm very disciplined, like just with, I guess, everything, everything that I do, like every morning looks the same for me, you know, like wake up water with salt, with lemon, with do my mobility, you know, and, um, intermittent fat, you know, everything is like the same. Right. And so when it comes to training, it's, it's easy to take that because it's already in my daily life and it's easy to take it into training and still train when I don't feel like training or like I have, I have to cram it in somewhere. Um, and so I make sacrifices, which, um, to me is worth it, but I've always, I've been doing that for years. So it's kind of like, you know, it's just, it, 
it, again, that's kind of like a muscle too. And so, yeah, I, I definitely have a perfectionist attitude, which I've kind of, uh, you know, can be a bad thing too at some points, right? Like um, you kind of got to, there's kind of got to be a balance there too, because you don't want to, you don't want to burn yourself out when you're training for a hundred mile marathon or ultra marathon, because it's a lot of training. And if you get sick of it month one out of, you know, like a six month training plan, you know, that's, that can be tough. So I try to balance that a little bit more and I try to, and that's something that through hiking has actually helped me with is being so type a I'm on an itinerary, right? Cause I don't want to get fired from work when I'm like, <laughs> I gotta, I gotta get this done by the time, you know, so I can fly home and like get back to work. And, uh, so I have like this tight itinerary and when I don't make that, which often occurs because so many variables come up with through hiking, right. you can, you can try to account for, but you never account for all of them. And, uh, so that's kind of helped me pull back that type a, a little bit and learn to adapt a little bit more and take things as it is. Yeah. I, I always say that our biggest strength is often our, our biggest weakness, right? Or <clears throat> our, our weaknesses, our strengths yeah. gone too far. And that that's fascinating. Yeah. That you kind of been able to, to, to channel some of that in, in the outdoors and be able to learn a little bit about your, yourself. Do you, do, how, how do you feel like you've been able to change and evolve off trail based upon some of those learnings in terms of what you've done on the trail? Oh yeah. That's a great question. Really good question. Uh, the trail is like a gratitude reset. Number one, uh, it, when you are, you know, you don't, like, I, you don't shower for 11 days. You don't have, um, you know, good food. So you're not, eat, you're not eating that healthy. It's all processed shit that I, uh, I never eat in real life, you know? And, um, you know, you have to filter your water every day. You're sleeping in a tent, you're sleeping on the ground, you're, you know, and stuff like that. And so when you get home, actually, it's super interesting because one of the bigger lessons that I learned is, is to, <laughs> really just be grateful for what I have. It's so nice. Yeah. Right? Service again. You're like, Oh my God, I can be on Instagram. You, got, <laughs> you, got, you know, you don't have to conserve your battery anymore. It's, it's like, it's mind blowing. And so for like the first few weeks after trail, I really am in this real good uh, gratitude mindset. I wish I could say that that lasts forever, but it doesn't, at least for me, I, you know, every time I go out, it does again, it's kind of like a muscle where you, you kind of build on it, but it doesn't last really forever as intense as it was when I got home, obviously. But I really think um, for anybody that's really interested in like, you know, backpacking through hiking or anything like that um, and is interested in, in having more gratitude in their life, that is a great, that is a speed highway to get there real fast, you know? Yep. Um, and yeah. And as, as far as like the adaptability, like, like I was kind of saying, it's just helped me to really just learn how to adapt um, adapt and overcome. And that's something that you have to do in ultra marathons too, is, is it's really comes down to both through hiking and ultras is like, how well can you adapt? Because again, so many variables come up, you can try to account for most of them, but you know that there's going to be some that you're not accounting for. Like in the Colorado trail this year, I got poison, uh, sumac all over my legs, like the second day. Right. So I knew there was going to be some lows on trail, but I didn't know that I was going to be itching my face off and my legs off every day, you know, before I go to sleep and, you know, adding that on to the mileage I was trying to do every day, it was tough. So, but you got to just adapt to it, man. It's just, it's a kind of de a defining moment, you know, whether you're, whether or not you can. Yeah. It's that, it's that adversity, you know, you know, you're going to, you're going to meet that adversity and the ultimate test as I, I believe in, in humans or, as you know, as, as workers, certainly, you know, it sounds like as you know, a backpacker or, you know, yeah. an endurance athlete, it's how are you going to respond? Yes. You know, the, yeah. the adversity is going to, going to hit and it's, it's up to you to try to, to figure that out. So no, yeah. I, I, I love that thinking. I, I I'm curious, you're, you're talking a little bit about, you know, folks, folks who, who might be, might be listening here. Um, I'd love to hear what advice would you give, um, with, with someone who's into the outdoors and being active but might be a little intimidated with the idea of, you know, 30 days on the Colorado trail or, or on yeah. any trail or the yeah. idea of, of running a marathon plus 
you know, um, on a trail. So like, what, what advice would you give to someone when they're like, I'm into it, but man, that's, that sounds really intimidating, Chad. Yeah. For me, for me, I'm all about graduated practice. So I, I, I never started like the hardest thing ever, you know, like I started running five K's like several years ago and, you know, 10, I literally, it was literally like a ladder, five K, 10 K, you know, um, half. And then I skipped the actual official marathon and then just went to a 50 K. But um, it's really for me, yeah, it's about graduated practice. I think same with um, hiking. People will ask me like, um, you know, how do you hike solo all the time? Like, aren't you scared like overnight? And like, hell yeah. Like I used to be super scared staying overnight by myself, you know, but you know, I, I started by camping next to my car one time at a campground just by myself. Once you wake up from that and you don't go home, you feel just, you feel like you could take on the world. It's just such a great feeling because you got over some of those demons that are trying to get you to go back home, you know? Um, And then, uh, yeah, I think it's just, it's just get started. And if you can find a mentor, because that is going to accelerate your learning tenfold. Um, And a lot of times with hiking and ultra running, you're going to be on similar trails. Like both things are, are on similar trails, right? Like you can run a trail, you can hike a trail, but I've met so many people just hiking, just backpacking and just trail running that have the same, that kind of like-minded mind. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times they have a different skill set than I do in something, or they have more experience. And so just hanging with them is, is priceless. I think in my mind. Yeah, I lo- love it. And, and I want to come back to this, this uh, idea of, of mentorship. And because uh, I think that's, that's so important for, for so many of us, but I want, I want to maybe turn, turn back the clock a little bit here, right? So obviously, you're, you're now in, in Oregon, doing what I think most people would say, like pretty, pretty extreme, pretty you know, uh, ad- adventurous, aggressive things outdoors, which I personally love. But I want to go back. So you, you grew up in, in Wisconsin, and, and you found, you found your way out to the Pacific Northwest. So what, what was that journey like? And, and how did you start to get in, into things, uh, you know, a, a little bit, particularly on the, on the trail? Yeah, that's a good question. So, yeah, obviously, um, you know, we took some, uh, snowboarding trips out West when I was in college. Basically I fell in love with the West at that point. Um, after college, I graduated, moved out here with a now with a ex-girlfriend, but you know, it was a girlfriend at the time, whatever didn't work out anyway. Uh, and so, yeah, I, my big thing back then was I wanted to do backpack hunting. I would watch Primos and you know, all this stuff. Right. And I was like, Oh my gosh, like, this is so cool. Um, but I didn't know anything, anything about, uh, trail systems. Like when I first got to Oregon, I would bomb out to the back country and I wouldn't even hike on, tra- like, I didn't even know really trails kind of, ex- I don't know what I was thinking. There was no <laughs> all trails app. There was no apps. Like there was no Onyx maps. There was nothing like that. Just that drive point. to the, just drive to the mountains and start walking. Right. You know, I, that's exactly what I was doing. I was like, man, this is pretty tough. Cause you know, you're bushwhacking <laughs> places and like, like, wow, dude, this is, I don't know how people are doing this. You know, how are people, and so, yeah, like that kind of transitioned into, um, I was more of a, in a hunting phase at that point. I wasn't so much into the backpacking. Um, and then kind of in 2016, I actually started, uh, jujitsu. And when I started jujitsu, um, I did that, that was kind of a, another launch pad that kind of, um, for one reason or another, once I started that, I cleaned up my life a lot. Um, can, can I interrupt you for a second? Why, why, yeah. why, why was it that you, you started jujitsu in the first place? Like what, what was that like the very first day you went yeah. to work on a mat? Because my understanding oh, yeah. of jujitsu is it's, you kind of get your ass kicked for, for a while until <laughs> you start, you start getting to be, be decent. Um, and, and it's, it's tough to, to get started in jujitsu. You're so, dude, you're so, there's actually, there was a meme that when I was first starting training, it was like the first six months of jujitsu was like, and there was like this guy with his head in the pool, like from the top or whatever, you know, cause you're like drowning. You're like seriously drowning in people because you don't know anything and you're just getting just worked. Right. And so what actually happened was I was, I went out to Eastern Oregon, long ass drive. I 
had a miserable time. I went home early. I, I was, I was very, when I was younger, I would always plan on doing like a five day thing. I'd always leave on the day two because I'd get lonely or whatever. I just, I didn't have that mental muscle at that point. And so I'm driving home and I was talking to a buddy from Wisconsin and he was talking about how he rode his bike from, I think, Madison to the border of Wisconsin or something. I don't know, some kind of crazy stuff. And I was like, dang, that was, that's pretty cool. You know? And I was like, hunting really isn't working out for me right now. What if, what is something that I can do that would make me proud of myself? You know? And there's a jujitsu ju dojo down the street. I was like, there's no excuse why I can't do this. I've always wanted to do it. Yeah. So I go in there, you know, and got worked. I mean, I, I mean, I still get worked. Right. But like I got worked for, yeah, a good six months to a year. And you have to be someone that enjoys in a weird way, getting just beat. I, I don't know like what else to say because but you got, I always thought like, you know, I'm, at least I'm getting more training than the people that aren't training. You know what I mean? At least I know what, what's going, you know, uh, at least I know how I'm going to respond. And so from then on, I just, yeah, I fell in love with jujitsu. I, I still do it to this day. I, I'm uh, trying to get my purple belt, uh, which hopefully will come this year. I hope, <laughs> but um, yeah. So, um, but the weird thing about jujitsu is that I started doing jujitsu for like uh, 2016, I did it for, um, that summer and I was doing so much jujitsu. I didn't do any backpacking or anything, anything outside for a whole summer. And, and so winter came and I was like, wow, I didn't do anything with my summer. Right. So that next year I started planning more stuff. I started getting more into backpacking and stuff. And that was a big, t uh, a big thing for me too, is I started prioritizing my summers and so like months before summer would come, I would block out weekends. I would block out weeks and I would, I would write down, this is, I'm going to backpack here. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And just that simple act of blocking stuff out, writing it down. I would adhere to that even when people would try to invite me somewhere else. And uh, again, it just kind of creates that launch pad for, for doing bigger stuff, uh, more extreme stuff. And so, yeah, it was kind of weird how that works out, I guess, but yeah. That's what I do to this day. So no, I, there's so much power in that, which is just being purposeful and thoughtful for where you spend your time. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's pretty amazing. Just the act of saying, okay, I'm disappointed with how things went last summer in terms of me being outside in nature, which is obviously something that's super important to you. So I'm going to put on my calendar and I'm going to honor that, you know, that for, I'm going to honor myself in that need for, for that time. And then yep. I'm just going to go after it and, and, and do it. And I think yep. too many of us wind up getting caught in this. Sometimes it's, it's day to day, hour to hour, you know, week to week, month, month, whatever it is, we're, we're just like letting life happen to us as opposed to being 100%. like, hey, what is it I'm going to do? I mean, I know I've you know caught myself. I'm not proud of this, but you catch yourself suddenly like watching garbage on TV and then 10 minutes you're like, what am I, what am I doing? Like, I don't want to watch this. I am not interested in this at all. I just sh shut it off and, and keep going. But, you know, on, on a macro sense of life, I mean, you, you doing this obviously was, was a pretty big deal in terms of inspiring yourself, motivating yourself, like finding that, uh, finding that self definition in terms of who, who you are. And, and, and that's, that's really, yes. po really powerful. Yes. Yep. So yep. no, that's a great point. Yep. Yeah, my, my understanding though is so when you're rolling doing jujitsu, you, you actually had a bicep injury, and and that's something that sparked your interest, and in then getting more into ultra marathoning. So how how did that happen? What's yeah, that yeah, that was a great story too. So yeah, dude, I'm so you know we're COVID rolling at the time, so we're training underground in people's base, but we're actually in a hayloft at this point. This this is pretty you know Midwest stuff. We're in a hayloft, <laughs> and. Uh, you know, we we're, uh, we had mats, but at the end of the round, I wasn't rolling that well. I was overtraining cause I was going through a breakup. I was real. So I was using that as a lot of fuel, of uh, just really just grinding to the bone. Right. And so I'm in this role, this purple bell had tapped me out a little bit earlier. I was really not satisfied with my performance. We get to the end of the round. We have about five seconds left. He throws up a triangle the triangle was loose. And so I'm trying to posture out of it but in the process. He pulled my arm down and with two seconds left on the board, it extent, I thought I could pull it out and it just went pop, pop, pop. 
And then the bell goes off. And this is all on video too. And I just, I immediately knew, like, I like, I immediately knew it was screwed up. Um, and yeah, I tore the bicep, uh, basically from where it attaches down to your elbow. Um, I had to wait three weeks for surgery. Uh, cause I was actually incidentally, I always seem to get significantly hurt before I fly home to Wisconsin, which <laughs> I injured my knee in jujitsu, same thing like three years ago. And so I fly home, I fly back, I get the surgery. Um, and at this point I'm in a sling, I can't do jujitsu. And I'm like, well, screw it. I have my trail legs, which is just a term for, you know, uh, fit legs from, from the JMT, the John Muir trail that I did uh, a couple months prior. I still have those. I've been running a little bit. There's a 50 K in about a month and a half, 31 miles. And I was like, I called some of the people that have done these types of things before. I said, do you think I can do this? Do you, you know, get some feedback. They said, hell yeah. You know, start, you know, just do what you can. So I did what I could. I actually have some videos of me just running in a sling, which I actually kind of think was cheating because it was actually taking some of the slack out of your arm. But um, yeah, so I, I basically, I, I trail ran all of November being really careful not to slip and fall on my arm and, you know, didn't tell my doctor about this at all. And so, yeah, I basically, I tried to, to, to put a good thing where a bad thing was, right? Like I, uh, I have this book that I always read when I'm going through, it seems like any type of injury or something. It's called the obstacle is the way by uh, Ryan holiday. It's a good stoic book. And uh, one of the things in there was like, you know, never waste, a good crisis. And so I was like, okay, well, how can I make, how can I make this good? You know? And, uh, so yeah. So in December, early December, I just ended up running like 50 K and completed it, cramped up a lot, learned a lot though, uh, running it. And, um, yeah, it was awesome. It was really cool. It was actually the same 50 K that, uh, Cameron Haynes and David Goggins ran the year prior. Uh, it's actually where Cam lives. So I don't know if you know them, but yeah. So that's that's fascinating. What what a, what a great what a great story. Um, mm -hmm. So when it when it comes to ultra marathon, I got a really hard hitting question here here for you, and that's something that anyone who's ran distance and is listening, it's got to be running through their mind. And that is simple. How do you manage the chafing, Chad? Such a good question, dude. Well, actually, I don't think I have it in one of these boxes right here. But body glide, it's this stuff you can get it off of Amazon body glide you got it you just got to lube up i always had i always chafe between my thighs that's that's always where i chafe is between the thighs i really don't chafe anywhere else and if i don't do that for a run that's over about 22 miles or so i always chafe i don't know what it is but anything below that I don't, i'm good but beyond that do the body glide i love it it's good stuff it's say it actually <laughs> The first ever long distance hike I did, which was just like a hundred miles was, uh, saved by body glide. I didn't think I was going to complete it because my thighs were chafed up so bad, but put it on the night, woke up, was perfect. Ready to go. Definitely recommend. <laughs> Love it. Okay. So you, you, you talked about running these, these long races. So you, you ran, uh, the, the, the 50 miler, um, excuse me, the, the 50 K to, to start. So when you're actually running an ultra marathon, I mean, what, what's your strategy as you're, as you're starting the race and as you continue to, to go, uh, go, go through all, uh, 31.1 miles or whatever the case may be upwards from yeah. there. Well, you don't, you don't want to, at least for me, because I'm not like one of those elite, elite runners, right? Like I, I got to make sure I throttle back. Um, and don't, you definitely don't want to start out too hard. I've seen many people that have started out way hard and they're not in it by the, you know, by midway through the race, they already DNF because they already burnt themselves out or, you know, some, or they got injured or something like that. So you right. definitely have to, you have to pace yourself. You also have to know that, um, you know, you got to know what you like to eat because when you get to these aid stations, nothing really looks good. Uh, and solid foods are hard to digest, but then you're eating like these goos all the time that just, you know, are like these like, eh, whatever, you know, so you're getting sick of those. You also got to account for your stomach might go south. 
um, which just simply means like it just starts cramping up because it's like, you know, all the blood isn't going to the digestive system. And, and so uh, you want to make sure like, well, one, you want to make sure you know what's at the aid stations before you get out there. So you know what to grab. You want to get in and out of those super fast. Like that's probably the biggest thing that'll kill your time is if is milling around at, at aid stations. Um, the second thing is if your stomach starts going south, you got to know, you got to grab the ginger ale. 100% it'll, it'll, it'll remedy it right up. I don't know why, but it does. It does. Um, so I would say, yeah, really pace yourself, especially from the beginning. I would say towards the end, you can let loose a little bit more, start going a little bit faster because you're probably going to finish and you're kind of, you're getting pulled in by that finish line, you know, um, and then really get in and out of those aid stations as fast as possible. Just don't screw around there. Another thing is too, is like, for me, I don't like to sit down because if I do, I start getting uh, cold. I start kind of cramping up a little bit. Um, Another thing too is make sure you're you're uh, taking your salt tabs and electrolytes every at least every forty five minutes to prevent cramping. Big thing there too. So for for you, how important is the race versus the journey? Yeah, you know it's funny because when you do this training block, you you're okay. So for my fifty miler, I train from. And the middle of January all the way to I ran in June 12th. So I ran for, yeah, like six months, right? So you're running for all these months and then you get to the race. But if you look at the percentage of the hours that you've spent, the race is only accounts for like 2%, you know, or something like that. Like, I, I mean, hardly anything. I mean, you're almost 95% done with the entire thing by the time you get to the race. You know, so it's like 5% of the entire thing. Um, and so, yeah, the journey for me is, is really just, yeah, obviously more important. It's, it's just really co- overcoming all those demons to, to get to that starting line in the first place and to finish it. Um, the race obviously is super important too, because if I don't finish that, I kind of feel like maybe I tossed something, you know, I, I kind of ruined or uh, kind of wasted stuff, but I think in the journey, you definitely find out a lot about yourself because it simulates a race and the fact that you're going to have highs and lows in training. You're going to have highs and lows in your race. How do you get past those? Are you going to use what you learned in your training period and your training blocks to, you know, get past those? That's, it's, a, it's a good skill that I've used. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you definitely know if you get to the race and you haven't trained, you can tell that you can see people that have not trained, right? Or on through hikes, you can tell people that I've literally just got off the couch and they started through hiking. And for me, I, I want to have the best experience possible. So yeah, I try to <laughs> try to make it as good as I can in that prep phase. And I, it, it excites me. I like having that prep phase it's fun. Oh yeah. That's, that's gotta, be, that's gotta be 95% of the fun since it's 95% of the time. Right. <laughs> it is. It is. And, and like the whole time, the whole time you have a goal, right? Like you have a goal that you're striving for every day. So like, it's easier than if you're just running to maintain something or whatever. It's like, it's nice to have that goal that you're thinking about the whole time. So, yeah. So w- what have you learned throughout this process about, about yourself and, and how has that maybe evolved where you see yourself going in the future as well? So I would say with the, with the ultra marathon and the, and the 50 uh, miler or in the 50 miler and the, the 50, 50 K that was like acutely, like the hardest thing I've done in like one day, right? Like the 50 miler was definitely the hardest thing I've done in a day. Yep. I would say as far as um, hardest thing I've ever done, was definitely the Colorado trail and the John Muir trail. And I think what I learned from those is, and and it's because it's such a durational thing. It's simply the duration. You wake up every, you have uh, this large goal, 500 miles, and you wake up on day two and you have 470 left. And you're like, wow. So, (laughs) Some things that I've learned just from the JMT and the CT specifically were um, you can always do more than you think. There's always going to be a low spot in, in what you're doing, no matter if it's business, 
or if it's, um, you know, training for this or when you're actually in it. Um, but how, again, how you adapt, how you respond to that is going to de- be that defining moment, but everybody gets there. Like you are going to have that low spot. And so knowing that, um, really kind of taking that into my life and know, you know, especially when I get into, you know, just regular work weeks or something like that, I'm like, I always think to myself, well, this isn't as hard as X, Y, and Z that I've done, you know? And that's very powerful because it really isn't. And I, I sometimes I'll like look at people too, you know, or jujitsu and I'll be like, you know, they haven't walked this many miles. I'll, I'll like play that. And that, that gives me a lot of power. Um, and so, yeah, some of those, I think the biggest lessons I've learned really have came from through hiking because you're out there for so freaking long and you have so much time to think and you have so many things that go wrong all the time, every day, you know, um, with the ultra, it's super hard. And I'm sure when I do this hundred, it's going to be, that's going to be, I can't even imagine. Cause I can't even imagine going 50 more after the first 50 I did. That's crazy. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm very pumped to see what I learn in that hundred because <laughs> I think it's going to be even, even more extreme than obviously what I've learned so far. One of the things that you mentioned earlier was how important, you know, mentorship is and how, when you get out on the trail, you just start actually doing things. You're going to meet like-minded people. You're going to find people who have different ideas, different approaches, or in your case, who just understand that there's hiking trails as opposed to bushwhacking through, (laughs) through, through the mountains and the forest. But I, I, but, but, but in all seriousness, um, what, what, it, who, who's been an important mentor for you uh, along the way? And kind of what, what have you learned, whether, whether that was like a small adjustment or, or yeah. a big, big adjustment? Yeah. Great question. Uh, my first ever longer hike, like I said, it was like hundred miles on the PCT. I met this guy. He was 68 years old. Uh, his trail name is salty dog. And I met him the first day I was kind of like, I'm going to do this solo. I'm going to do it by myself. You know, I'm the man, blah, blah, blah. Right. This guy comes in, rolls into camp. We end up hiking the next week together. Uh, and I thought I was going to smoke this guy. Right. This guy is pulling 20, 25 miles. Like it's no problem, man. I'm, I'm 20, whatever. And I'm like, how is he doing this? Right. I learned so much, so much from that week. Uh, it was unreal. Just how, efficient you can be with your pack and, and, and all this other little, little stuff. And I honestly don't think I would have gotten through some of those sections. Uh, in particular, it was a high snow year that year. So a lot of people were turning back from this particular section, not going through it. We decided to push through soup. That was the best day on trail. And I wouldn't have done that without him and his, his experience huge for me. And so we stay in contact today. I still ask him stuff bounce ideas off of him and stuff like that. Um, so I think honestly, he's been the biggest mentor for me, but outside of that, I really get a lot of inspiration, a lot of, um, tips and stuff off of literally just like YouTube, Instagram, David Goggins, Cam Haynes, those guys, uh, super inspirational to me. Um, and I just love following them because it really does kind of light a fire under you when you don't feel like doing something, you know? For, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Well, 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 Chad, you, you've been really generous with your, with your time here today. Um, but before you leave, just a, a couple of quick questions <laughs> for, for you. So you're, you're obviously a really positive guy. You set your mind to things, you, you find a way to make that happen. I love it. But on the flip side of that, there's gotta be some pet peeves out of there. So what is your biggest pet peeve? Oh gosh. Okay. So number one, and this happened to me on right after I completed the Colorado trail, get up to the, to the sign. You're in Durango, super happy. This older gal comes over. Oh, what'd you guys do? Oh, you know, it's trail Denver Durango. Oh, you guys aren't going to be able to do that when you're my age. Uh, knee, you're going to have to have knee replacements and this and that. I'm like, no, no I think we're going to be good. I think you just need to take care of your body is what I said. Everybody's kind of like looking at me like it's awkward. And I was like, what an odd thing to say to someone that just completed this big thing. She says it again later on in the conversation. And again, I, I addressed it directly to her. Um, and it's just kind of an example of I, one of my biggest pet peeves is, is 
and I don't know if people like they just nonchalantly do it or if they just kind of like they don't understand what they're doing, but they will like tell you you can't do what you're gonna do, right? And so I hate especially people that are older than you and that aren't like fit or don't do your lifestyle, right? Like <laughs> right. someone that like I have people in mind that every time I, you know, they ask me what I do for the weekend, blah blah, blah I did this or this. Well, you're not gonna do that when I'm when it, it's like, well, now I'm 30 and it's like, there's people my age that can't even get out of the truck in, into jujitsu practice, more or less, you know, do it. And so I really, my biggest pet peeve, and it just, it fires me up, man. Just rage is people telling me that I can't do, that I'm going to do something. Uh, I, or I can't do something when I get older. And then they're like that older person or whatever, but they didn't take care of their bodies in the first place. Um, that's the biggest one. Um, also, group text kind of pissed me off <laughs> <laughs> gotta silence those definitely gotta, oh gotta, my gotta silence gosh. Text, right? that was terrible yeah <laughs> so all right so so obviously salty dog he didn't participate in any of those pet peeves he's uh, he, he's more oh. of a, um, a mentor but what okay. what did salty dog call you in other words what is your trail name chad so i actually got a trail name on the ct and it was scratch and that's because of my poison sumac <laughs> very perfect. fitting perfect yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I absolutely love it and so um what what is the greatest piece of advice you've, you've ever received you know i i actually again this is another thing on the ct um i've had my wall is kind of decorated in, in quotes and stuff and i actually was kind of looking at it before we talked but i i have to say that i think the best i was actually again i, I love talking to just people, older people that are positive and that I, where I want to be when I get that age. And there was some older people, I was kind of having a, a tough day on the CT just talking to them. And, uh, they were saying, uh, you know, this too shall pass, right. We're talking about thunderstorms. I was like every day, man, like every, day. <laughs> he's like, you just got to think this too shall pass. Well, a week later, I get caught in a thunderstorm. I'm like literally like on the, the border of hypothermia. It's like six o'clock p.m. I'm sh I'm shivering and I'm and it's just pouring and I'm just thinking, okay, like this will pass at some point. Like this has to pass, right? And so that really fired me up the rest of the CT because I knew things weren't going to be just that bad forever. Um, it gives you hope, which is super important, especially. If you're trying to do an endurance activity, I think is, is, is that hope. So yeah, I think that's the big, the best for me. Yeah. Positive energy, hope, knowing that uh, tough times will be a thing of the past and ultimately be a yeah. memory. That's, that's really powerful stuff. Well, yeah. I, I really appreciate you and I'm sure our listeners really appreciate it. Um, we appreciate you being part of the muskox herd chat. I know love, you, love it. you do a lot, you know, you're telling me earlier about some of the, the stuff uh, that you were wearing yeah. on the CT and, and, and you're a big fan and, and we appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. If, if you guys want to, you know, browse uh, the muskox website or our Instagram, you are sure to find some pictures of, of Chad doing some really yes. cool stuff out there. Yes. Cool. <laughs> Well, th thanks so much, Chad. We appreciate you joining us here on The Herd of Spoken. Love it, Brad. Thank you so much. Like I was saying, I love the Charleston on the CT. It was my goat. It was one of my favorite pieces of gear by far. So thank you. Thank you for hooking me up. And I appreciate it, man. Well, that's it for today's episode of The Herd Has Spoken. Appreciate you listening. I want to thank Chad. Uh, loved his lesson. I, I thought it was really fantastic how he started out literally not even knowing how to go backpacking on a trail and he's turned into someone who's backpacked not only the Colorado Trail, but 100 miles of the Pacific Coast Trail and the John Muir Trail as, as well. So really love hearing that story of, of, of Chad. We appreciate uh, you, you giving us a listen. We really appreciate you liking and reviewing the podcast that really helps us to be able to get a little bit more traction and spread the good word about the herd has spoken and about muskox do yourself a favor go to gomuskox.com and check out all the great outdoor gear that we have to help you get ready for your next adventure whether you're going to be hiking the colorado trail like Chad, or doing something a little bit more uh, local in, in your neck of the woods, Muskox has, has got you covered. 
Until next time, I am your host, Bradley Hoos, here at The Herd Has Spoken.